Hi, I'm Wayne Tuttle and welcome to Chasing Legends. Welcome back to Chasing Legends. I'm Wayne Tuttle, and before we get started this week, please hit the subscribe button, hit the notifications bell, go down to the about section, long sleeve, short sleeve, black, gray, Legend of the Superstition Mountain, and Dutch Hunter Rendezvous shirts. Okay, we don't make anything off of them. Leave comments if you want to leave a comment. I'm sure there might be a few this week, people asking a few questions about this story. Before we break in, we just got through the holidays again. You're coming out of it, we're going back to work. A word to the wise. There are gentlemen like Tom Colliborn, Clay Worst, 70 plus years in the mountain in research. Um, there's so many others. Um, the 55, 60 years that Bob Shoes, Ron Feldman, Brian Lickman, and so many others. A number of others have put in 30, 40 years by myself, somewhere in the 40s, some odd years range. When you approach these people, we always like to be very kind. We like to talk to you. We love sharing stories. We like to hear what you think. When you think you're the first guy that's come to us with Google Maps and you've come with a solution to the snow maps, I hate to bring this to you, it's not even Maine, you're probably the hundredth guy this year that's done this to any one of us. Secondly, when we're sitting down to dinner, or definitely it's a holiday Easter dinner, and this is to the three or four people decided to email, message, and call me. I'm not taking the call at this time because there's a difference between obsession and being into something. I'm into the Lost Dutchman. I take this very serious. But please remember, don't expect us to jump up and grab that text, man, just as soon as we sat down to eat at dinner. It's not like that. It's not like a movie, okay? There is a little time to breathe there, okay? So not admonishing people, but trying to give us ourselves, the rest of us, sometimes a little space. We like to listen to people. We want to be able to interact and communicate about what people think they found and so forth. Just because you said I'm totally wound up and I'm the one that found it. I'm sure Clay and Tom Colomborn heard that thousands of times and I'm not kidding. I've heard it hundreds if not over a thousand times. So we're very patient, we're very methodical. Rule of the wise number two, when you're talking to Clay Worst or myself or Bob Schuess or Ron Feldman, telling us how we don't know the story after we've, you've read three books and we've had the archives open to us for many, many years and we've read hundreds of books on the subject and we've spent countless hours, days, weeks, months in the mountains to act like we don't really understand something that's not going well. So I'm um, always understand we're trying to work with you. If you found it and we can find a way to get you around the forestry service and make you a wealthy man, we're all 100% behind you. There's no one trying to shyster you out of something or steal your thing, okay? So just settle down and relax. That's to all of you, the dozen or so in the last few weeks that have recently found the mine. It's an amazingly I think it's a multi-universe mind actually be. It's a multiverse, right? Multiverse is the term now. So there we go, but let's get into this week's subject matter. I wanted to get back into some tales and some stories. I know we don't do those enough, but we do our own kind of version into it. We don't just tell that story and just kind of keep it out there as a mystery or a storytelling moment. We like to talk about it and then kind of poke some holes in it and kind of look at it as what it might actually mean and be. This way, this week, we will talk about Bill Jenkins' load or Bill Jenkins' lost ledge or whatever they want to call it. Now, it seems like it's just a number of people when they bring it up. They're always surprised that I kind of forget some of the details of it because really, when you come to William Jenkins' lost load, there's one book. That's Thunder God's Gold, Barry Storm, John Clemenson. Um, that's the primary source you have for that story. It's not in Sims Ely's book that I can remember. I think that has Wagoners, but it doesn't have Jenkins. And Storm was quite, and it seems like a story specifically to, um, a story specifically to Storm. I know there's a few other books that carry this story. Tom, I don't think he wrote about it in his books. He probably did an article about it, talking about it. I don't think Tom, it's in um, Ride Through Time or the other books necessarily. 
Now, the gist of the story is there's a man named Bill Jenkins, and him and his wife Marion, his two daughters, they go up. They go up by Canyon Lake, and they go over by the steel bridge, and he said they pulled over there, and they went walking back up into the canyons, up in this down south, going into the superstitions. After walking an hour or two, uh, Marion finds an old mesquite log or a mesquite tree that went down they could sit on, and they unpacked their picnic basket and stuff, and they had their picnic lunch. After they'd finished lunch and they're sitting in the shade and they're relaxing there, it must have been a shade tree, something, but the weather's great and everything, so Bill says, I'm going to go off and take a little bit of a hike for a little bit. Now, they're two hours back to the car, so I don't know why you need to hike, because you got to still hike back out, but he decided to go for a hike. <clears throat> he hiked for a while. He said he was gone no longer than about an hour. And this is according to Barry Storm. But after a while, he kind of got a good view of Weaver's Needle. It was to the south. He said it was about a mile and a half away. And he started to turn around and head back. And on the way back, there was a bunch of this clear white kind of rock. And it was really pretty looking. And Marion liked to collect rocks to take home to the house. So he took this good-sized rock, and he decided she'd really like that. And he picked it up and brought it back to the picnic. They finished wrapping everything up, rock, picnic basket and all, pretty much most of their stuff. They gathered up. Two-hour walk. They get back to the car. They pack everything up, drive back home. Now, I believe before that, <clears throat> during that time or afterwards, they lived in Tucson. And that's where we have them basically placed. So I don't know if that during that immediate moment they were in Phoenix for a time or if they drove all the way back to Tucson, which was quite a drive after that, especially in those days. By the way, this is 1937. So all this unfolds. He goes home and a friend notices the rock and says, you know, that could be a nice piece of ore. You should bust that open there, Bill. So he takes a hammer, busts the thing open, it splits open, and there's stringers of gold in it, supposedly. Now I say supposedly because none of us have a picture, none of us have a sample of it. We have two people's words for this. Well, a few people's words, and we'll get to that later, but initially it's just Bill Jenkins and Barry Storm. So Bill Jenkins decides, ah, oh, wow, there's this gold in here and all. So he contacts someone he knows, a man named John Clemenson, who's known as Barry Storm. I guess he just happens to know Storm. So he's not a prospector. He's not into geology. He has no idea what he's got. He's pretty sure this is gold. So he gives it to Storm. Storm says, if I get half and you get half, I'll go take this and have it assayed and kind of see what it's worth and all, and we'll go partners on this. And Storm goes off, has it assayed. Storm's claim is it was $2,000 per ounce, or 2,000 ounces per ton is what he had it assayed at. We do not have this assay report, okay? <laughs> you got to remember, they, they basically, for a few ounces a ton nowadays, it's a big deal. So, but this is 2,000, okay, per ton, which is a lot of gold. So that's what Storm comes back. But when he comes back, Bill has had his assay to know suddenly the value possibly of it, and that it's real gold, and it could be rich. And he does not want to partner with Barry Storm. Storm basically goes down to Tucson, and every time he's going through Tucson, he goes by the Jenkins house, talks to Mary, and tries to get her to convince Bill he wants to go out. Bill says, I'm going to put my own expedition together. I will go in the mountains. I will find this. According to Barry Storm, a couple years go by, and he continues to just kind of go work at them to see what would it take, what will it be, because Jenkins never seems to get back out to the place. And Storm finally convinces Bill Jenkins to go out, and they will take this short trip and they will go to the picnic site and then start to explore the area and see what he can remember. But even though it's been a year or two, and lo and behold, what happens? The door behind me magically opens by a ghost named Jax. No, oh, it's Rocky, okay. The rock has opened the door. Hope it's not too distracting. So anyways, Jenkins decides finally, okay, you know what, Barry, sir, we'll do it. And they agree. They set a date to do it. And then Jenkins doesn't show up. Storm doesn't know what's going on. Never hears from him again. Finally, next time he's in Tucson, he goes to see Mary and finds out Bill Jenkins had a heart attack. And he died. So then Storm gets the story from Marion, the wife, Marion Jenkins. And she basically thinks she can kind of figure some of it out, but she decides to kind of share with Storm she gives him a map and gives him as much information as he can, and Storm says he goes back in. This is about 1939, 1940, or in the early 40s. And he goes in, and he can find the picnic site because they'd left some jars under the log. 
So he says he could find the place where they had the picnic, but from there he didn't have enough information, and then World War II starts, and he wasn't able to continue to explore. And that's the end of the story. I don't think Barry Storm ever talked about it again, never printed anything, published anything, and that seems to be the end of it. But it's not the only version of the Jenkins story. Now, many, many, many years later, a gentleman named Al Reeser, who was a wonderful researcher, the Lost Dutchman of Mind, the Superstition Mountains. And note this, I, I think this is a particular thing I have, is there are a lot of people who do great research and have done great research and written excellent books. I always quote the material on who and who and who and what and where these sources come from. Um, there's other people that don't do so. There's people that put stuff on social media and it just is ridiculous to me. See, the ultimate problem is that when you use someone else's source material, just give them a nod. Whether it be Tom Collinborn or Thomas Glover or it be Al Reeser's or an unpublished document, just cite where the source material came from. Don't change a few words and, and do that because it's not worth it. These gentlemen put a lot of time and effort and they deserve the credit where it is. But anyhow, Al Reeser gets a letter and a guy named, I'm trying to remember his name now, Schnell. His last name was Schnell, George Schnell. But his name was Schnell, and Al Reeser got some information from him from the, about Jenkins. Al Reeser took this and passed it along to um, Clay Worst. Because Clay Worst, I guess, was writing a book at the time and wanted the information for the book he was writing and intending to write, which has never happened. We've all been waiting for that book, and I don't know if Clay will ever do that. And that's a shame, because it would be awesome to read Clay's interpretation of the situation on things. But that moving forward, Clay did loan it to Jim Hatt, the late Jim Hatt. And Jim Hatt did a pamphlet about Bill Jenkins' lost ledge, Bill Jenkins' lost gold whatever his thing was there was a hair floating by me there we're having a strange night magically the door shut so moving forward this letter he talked about it and said well none of this really happened the way it did in fact within a month or so or two or three me and another guy and bill jenkins and barry storm did go together we went back in the mountains we went to the picnic site and then from there Jenkins seemed a bit lost, wasn't quite sure what he'd seen, and the further back they got in, they could not seem to resolve what canyon it was he turned back into. It just seemed they could never resolve stuff. He said he also felt like Storm had pulled Jenkins out of the hospital. He wasn't very healthy, he seemed rather ill. Um, he believed he might have been in the veterans hospital or something for some issue at the time. Um, this is not surprising. The next thing I'm about to say is that Jenkins, within a certain period of time, in 1937, after he'd found this, and went in with Barry Storm, had a heart attack and died. So that part's true. So Barry Storm was fibbing about the whole bunch of stuff of like, oh, he wouldn't go with me, and I tried for two years to bug him, and then it finally resolved itself in 1939. Now, Schnell also, I think, mentioned that Barry Storm had almost wore him his welcome out with Jenkins because he incessantly bugged him to the point of harassment. So Jenkins probably went in the mountains just to get the guy off their backs. Now, that would be the only two sources we have, but we also have another source. Thomas Glover's book, um, Treasure Trails of Superstition, Clues, Maps, and Twice Told Tales. Good book. You can still find that. That is outside of Jim Hatt's book. One of the few other resources you'll find. I think Tom Collinborn did not put it in his books. He might. He probably wrote an article. But it's the only other source I really find for it. While people talk about that story quite a bit, it's not a well-known told story. You don't find it in most of the material that's on the bookshelf here behind me. Um, probably for the first reason is Barry Storm stretched some truths, told some non-truths. And there's just nothing substantiating it. We don't have the ore. We don't have a picture of anything. We don't have much information in the background. How did this guy know Barry Storm? I mean, he just pulled this author who had written Trail of the, Trail of the uh, Trail of Superstitions, but now he was writing Thunder Gods. Oh, where did this guy come from? He just pulled him out of his hat. Who knows? Anyways, Thomas Glover recounts all this, but also points out Tom Collinborn wrote an article about this. And in it, in it, Tom's information had it that when Jenkins is returning to the picnic site, 
he was going down this canyon. It was very brushy and bouldery, and he was trying to follow this game trail, and he saw this little stone circle. And in the stone circle down in this canyon, he looked down, and it looked like there was a post. And he got excited because he'd heard these things called arastras. Now, he didn't know anything about prospecting and lost mine searching. He just knew, thought, I think that's what they call an arastra. So it may not have been. He went down to get round to it, and when he got down in that area, there was a bunch of this white clear rock. And he looked around and found a really nice piece he thought his wife would like, and that's what he took out. Um, Tom's story otherwise pretty much relates the same as Barry Storms, except for the years past and do. But it pretty much goes with Schnell's. Now, it leaves us a lot of problems looking at it is, why would it be so hard to find this place and all this? Because basically, he said he returned back to the picnic area within the hour or so. His wife pretty much agreed that he'd only been gone for about an hour. So 15 to 20 minutes, and regardless of how fast he was moving, there's only such an arc that you could be in, so many canyons you could attempt to be in. So we got all this problem, but the $2,000 an ounce or 2,000 ounces per ton is a bit problematic too because that would be a mine like nobody's ever seen in the superstitions or probably just about anywhere in the world. Um, we don't have the samples of the ore. We don't have the story direct related from Jenkins to anyone else other than Schnell joined Storm and them on the partnership. I'm not sure about Schnell's relationship with Jenkins or Storm. He said him and another gentleman were a part of that. I do not have anything else they wrote. The story seems to basically drive completely from Storm. Jenkins obviously died within the year of the discovery, so it's literally Barry Storm's story, and Barry Storm seems to have just dropped it then and never revisited it. $2,000 per ton, I think that would be the one thing I'd be searching for for the rest of my life. We would just be wanting to grab a bunch of those rocks up off the ground. But for some reason, Barry Storm never revisits, never covers again. Could be he was searching for that, but we also know a lot about Storm's history after that incident in the, the 40s and the 50s and so forth. And I hate to tell it to all you guys that really love to believe this stuff. Storm loved to make stuff up. Storm made a lot of things up. We'll cover some of that later about what people thought of Barry Storm when he was in the mountains. I will tell you this, Tom Columborn's father knew Barry Storm, called him Clemenson, which was his name, John Clemenson. And he didn't seem to think much of him. I don't know what Tom, who had met Storm as well, his thoughts were on him. But most people seem to have kind of a bit of an odd kind of part, part like carny man, part shyster kind of deal with him, Storm. He liked, I think, being an author. And a lot of times the guys in the mountains referred to him as the author. So they didn't think he was as into trying to find the mine as writing books and trying to make that movie. And the movie, by the way, just for those people that watch this that always wonder, if you read Barry Storm's book and then you watch the movie Lust for Gold, you will find they have nothing to do with each other. That was entirely two completely separate things. And then Lust for Gold with Robert Kesselring has literally, other than Kesselring mentions Barry Storm's book, nothing to do... Well, it actually has clips from the film. So actually, I would say it has more to do with Barry Storm's book than the actual Lust for Gold movie that just simply uses his name. Um, and that was about it. But Barry Storm was one of those kind of guys that did that. There was nobody checking that stuff. There was nobody, you know, he just kind of was able to say what he had. And he had good information, but he also might have been hiding stuff. He also might have been just telling some stories for popularity because that book went through quite a few printings. He even was putting together his own pamphlet versions of it and stapling them together. Um, the last version, it, though, you can find a Kindle version of it still online. You can still occasionally find some out there. Um, Bob Schuess had the rights for um, Thunder God's Gold for years and reprinted a version of it. So there is a more modern kind of soft cover book of it out there. But you can usually find a copy of it. Don't pay very much for it because you can find it out there pretty handily and so forth. So that's it. That's Bill Jenkins. I've never known what to think of the whole story because it seems pretty simple laid out. You go in there, about two hours in, you find this mesquite tree. If Storm found it and these other guys knew where it was and located it, you're going to be 15, 15 to 30 minutes from that site. You're going to be able to work an arc and be able to decide how far he went to overlook at Weaver's Needle and then cut back one of the washes canyons in there. Um, the fact that they couldn't come up with anything and he seemed to completely lose where he was 
it's hard to say where he really was. You can draw a line on a map and kind of go after it. The problem is everyone's covered all that territory with a fine tooth comb and no one's ever come up with those rocks or that site or that circle with that post. Um, that's not to say it never was really there. It's that if you think you found it today, it's someone's put it there because it can't have been there in the last probably 40 or 50 years because there were so many people all through that area and traveling every inch of that ground. Someone would have ran into it in the bottom of a canyon because that's where they travel. So it's kind of a lost time thing. It would be cool if someone found a piece of quartz and came in and we found out it was worth a thousand or two thousand ounces per ton. That would solidify the story and tell us it was all true. But that's also something you physically have to hold in your hand. You have to crack it open. You have to have it assayed and have that assay paper to say this is this. If you don't do that and you just claim that sort of thing or just show us some fake piece of gold, photoshopped it, whatever, that's what it is. Um, too bad Jenkins didn't know what he had. Um, you know, for all of you that are not prospectors or geologists stuff, if you pick up a rock and it seems abnormally heavy, like, wow, this rock is abnormally heavy. It just seems like, and it's full of quartz and stuff, and you're looking, it could possibly have a lot of iron content, but it could also have gold in it because that's one of the things too. There's a lot of rocks that you can't really tell, but when you pick it up, you just suddenly feel the weight difference. And you can kind of go, wow, this is significantly, there's something different. That tells you, you could have a meteorite, you could have something with gold, but you're gonna have something with mineral content that maybe have a, take a hammer, crack it open, see what's in there. So that's being it. I hope everybody enjoy that, our kind of journey down Jenkins, Lost Ledge, Load, whatever we wanna call it. And I, I really wish there was more stories. I wanted to catch one that people kind of hear of, but it's not out there in as many books. And it seems like a lot of people have heard of it. So a lot of people seem to have picked it up in news articles or on the internet, but its source mainly was Barry Storm. I don't even think Thomas Glover in the um, Lost Dutchman Mine Part One, The Golden Dream, I don't even think he touches upon it in that book. I think it was something he added in the Twice Told Tale book. And which was very nice because I actually utilized that information. Like I said, pick up his book. Pick up the new book, um, Dutchman's Trail by Jesse Feldman. Um, pick up Jacob's Trail if you want to and have the set. But um, Jesse will sign them. I'm sure if you stop by the OK Corral, if you pick up your copy or if you pick it up anywhere else, like at the, the um, Superstition Mountain uh, Museum or Goldfield Ghost Town, go down, drop it off, or see if Jesse's down there and have him sign a couple of the copies. He'd be a very appreciative of that. But pick up a copy of those. Pick up a copy of Thomas Glover's books if you can. Anything else, Ron Feldman's autobiographies out there. I don't know if anything else new just popping up. If you got something new you're putting out there and it's something available and I can get my hands on it, let me know. I'll talk about it. Necessarily do a review, but I'll talk about it and try to get people to kind of check out your book and what you have to say. All right. That being said and done, I've talked long enough. Happy Easter to everybody and hope everybody's spring is going great as we whip out here through the hot and the cool spots as we get ready for summer to come. Until the next time, I'm Wayne Tuttle. You're not. And this was Chasing Legends. Take care.